children beside me and if you're wondering how he divides his time just let me say i never stand in line he loves me like i was his only child never felt such love before i can never lot of truth to that song you're here today and you don't know the love of God you don't know what you're missing that is true well let's open our Bible to 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 I want to talk with you today about heaven I thought that would be a wonderful subject to deal with after we've come through um, so much uh, activity with our uh, faith promise conference and a lot of victory Um, You know, over the years, there have been many people claim to have gone to heaven and come back and tell us all about it. Back in 2004, there's a boy named Alex Malarkey. That's his real name. His last name is Malarkey. And he was in a traffic accident and claimed to have died and gone to heaven. His accounts of heaven were published in a book that sold over 6 million copies. Then in 2010... The book was made into a movie, and that raked in over $100 million U.S. But in 2012, Alex's mother started admitting that the story wasn't completely true. And then in 2015, Alex himself admitted that he did not die. He did not go to heaven. He said he made up the story because he thought it would get him attention. In 2009, uh, a gal by the name of Crystal McVeigh claims to have died and went to heaven and came back and wrote not one but two best-selling books, and one entitled Chasing Heaven, the other Waking Up in Heaven, and now she travels the country as a guest speaker. Uh, In 2010, a book was published entitled Heaven is for Real. Maybe you've heard of this one which told about a four-year-old boy named Colton Burpo and how he went to heaven and came back to tell us all about the archangel Michael and Michael's special sword and Mary and John the Baptist and many others. Then in 2014, it became a blockbuster movie, also taking in over $100 million. Now, folks, in truth, what is the truth? The truth is that these stories have no biblical support whatsoever. They do not. 
Uh, they are not genuine experiences given by God. People do not make trips to heaven and come back and tell us about it. The stories are made up for whoever will buy them or believe them. Even Alex Malarkey, even he now says the Bible is all the proof we need. Even young Alex says that. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 4, the Apostle Paul told how he was allowed to visit heaven. That was a recount of Paul's experience. And there were things about that experience that he himself didn't even know. One of them was whether he was in the body or not. If he, if he knew, he would have said, but he didn't even know that. Uh, but he said, God knoweth. Now that's very true. God knows everything. There's nothing God does not know. By the way, if you're here with a heavy heart or a breaking heart, God knows that. And he knows all about what it is you're going through. But Paul here wrote of how he was allowed to visit heaven. But I want you to notice in verse 4 what he said. How, I, how that he was caught up into the paradise and heard. You see that next word? What is it? Unspeakable. Unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So he comes back to earth and he doesn't talk about it. Why? Because he couldn't. He couldn't, and I don't think he, he would either. And yet there are people today who claim they're going to heaven, they're coming back, they're telling us all about it. Folks, heaven belongs to God. When are we going to realize that? It, we don't have a claim per se. It's God's territory. He owns it. It belongs to him. And... Uh, God keeps certain things secret. That's just what he does. And other things are so far beyond our ability to understand. If a man were transported by a, a time machine, say from a hundred years ago, he was transported till today. And he, uh, he looked around and saw things and the technology we have and, and how we live our lives and how we race around streets on, on, in boxes with wheels on them at high speeds and how we talk into these tiny little handheld devices to people halfway around the world. And then we transport the man back to his time and his friend says, well, well, what did you see? Well, well uh, uh, um, um, that's about it. He would see things he wouldn't understand. They'd be unspeakable. Some things are just plain secret. Other things are unspeakable. But God actually has revealed, revealed a few things in the Bible about heaven. And we're going to take a look at that today. So let's begin now with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask please for special grace and understanding when we come to this subject of heaven. And uh, we sure don't claim to know it all. And we don't claim even to know a tenth. But we do know a few things only because they're in the Bible. And uh, Lord, please help us to understand them. Now, Father, we pray that you'd be honored in our hearts and glorified. Help us to learn things that will make us live more for you. We live too much for this world. It's, it's a pig, pig pen is what the world is, and we're just too much a part of it. Lord, help us to separate ourselves from it as much as possible anyhow. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again, to uh, echo the words of Alex Malarkey, he said, the Bible is all the proof we need. And the Bible actually does contain a surprising amount uh, when it talks about heaven. And we're going to look at those things, um, some of them anyhow, one at a time from the Bible. Now, number one, what is the economy of heaven? You see, when you move to another country, you want to know what the economy is. In fact, the economy is always changing, even in this country. And many people are following the stock market and so on. They want to find out the economy and the value of the Canadian dollar uh, as it uh, compares to the U.S. dollar, which is still the benchmark, just barely, but it's still the benchmark in the world. What is the economy in heaven? And the answer, we can answer that in one word, none. There is none. On earth, we need economy, we need cash flow in order to purchase things we need. But in heaven, we'll have all of our needs and wants supplied. It's like it says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Say the next words with me. I shall not want. And if that were ever true, that's true in heaven. 
all of our needs are going to be supplied. There's no need whatsoever for economy and cash flow and debits and credits and all that stuff that we need accountants to figure out down here on earth. We don't need that stuff. We don't have to budget up in heaven. There's no need. There is no economy per se. In heaven, our shepherd, Jesus, will supply everything for us. So that's a simple one to answer. Number two, will there be rewards in heaven? That's a good question. And the answer is yes. Two kinds of rewards. One is crowns and the other is treasures. Now crowns, there are several references in the, uh, the Bible to these heavenly crowns, but we'll take a look at one. And by the way, some people say, oh, I'm not interested in a crown. I don't want to get any crowns in heaven. Well, in that case, you probably won't. <laughs> but you don't have the foggiest idea of what a crown is by saying that. You don't understand much of anything about a crown if, you're, if your attitude is, oh, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not interested in a crown. Give them to someone else. Give them to someone else. No, no, not for me. No, you don't understand, my friend, what a crown is and the value of it. Now, let's take our Bible and we're going to go to the book of Revelation. Over to the right to the book of Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to, as much as possible, do this... Um, uh, in an organized, scheduled fashion. We're going to look at these things about heaven. We're going to spend a bunch of time here in Revelation. Then we're going to go back to the Gospels for, uh, to, to finish up, I think. But Revelation chapter 4, we're going to look at one of these uh, references to heavenly crowns. Revelation chapter 4, and uh, look at verse 4. It says, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, these crowns are proudly given to us by God, and they're meant for us to wear for His glory. For someone to say, Well, I don't want a crown in heaven. Well, then you don't want to glorify God in heaven. You don't understand the purpose of a crown is to bring honor and glory to God in heaven. It's not for selfish purposes. Uh, some people who say, oh, I don't want a crown in heaven, their real motive is uh, more like, oh, I'm not real interested in heaven much, you know, sitting around on a cloud with a harp. You know, it just doesn't, that's not my thing. But I want to get into things here on earth. Man, I want to play that lottery. I want to win that hundred million. I want to take a worldwide this. And I want to buy a mansion here and a mansion over there. I want my own jet, you know. And I want all of the bells and whistles and toys that this world has to offer. I want fame. I want fortune. Hey, I'm not asking much in life. All I want is a hundred billion dollars. And I want everyone to worship me. I'm not asking much in life. And people with that kind of attitude have very little interest in heaven. And yet the very smallest part of our eternity is spent right here on earth. And whether you live for 60 years, 70, 100 years, that's it. And then it's over. And then for all time and eternity, you see, you're out there somewhere, either saved with the Lord or lost in hell. One of the two. But your very shortest sliver of time is spent right here, right now. This is it. And we have no guarantee on tomorrow, do we? Some people are going to go to bed tonight and they're going to wake up in eternity tomorrow. That's true. They're going to die in the night in their sleep. Some will get up tomorrow morning and get ready for work and they'll get in the car and they'll die in an accident. I don't want to sound morbid. I just want to sound realistic. We've got no guarantee on tomorrow. None. In fact, the next five minutes, we don't know what could happen. Well, back to these crowns here. God gives us the crown so that we can glorify him. You say, how could we glorify God with a crown? Now you're in chapter 4 of Revelation, and I want you to now see verse number 10. Verse 10. It says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, that's the Lord Jesus, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their, what? crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created wow you know that suggests that we will gladly cast our crowns at his feet 
It's like giving him the very best we have. Now, crowns are not something that that everyone gets. Next Sunday, when you come to church, you're going to automatically get a poppy. We're going to give you a poppy. doesn't matter if you're male, female, young or old. doesn't matter if you're wearing your Sunday best or if you come in jeans or something. We're going to give you a poppy. In heaven, you get to heaven, it's not the same. You're not going to automatically be given a crown. We're going to talk about this in a little while, but crowns are only for those who sort of deserve them. They work for them. There's, that's an award. It's, it's something that they, it's, it's not just handed out willy-nilly. It, it's, it's an award. So we'll talk about that later. Now, the second thing is uh, what's called treasures. Treasures. Now, I got to break my own tradition here, but keep your finger there in uh, Revelation and go back to the Gospel of Matthew. We'll only be there for a moment, but Matthew chapter 6. I want you to see that there really are treasures in heaven. There's crowns, and then there's treasures. Now in chapter 6, Matthew, we've got the the sermon of our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, he tells us in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt. It means this, folks. If your eyes are on the money... If all you can think about is the money, get the education so you can get the best job, so you can get the most money, you got it all wrong. You are laying up for yourself in the wrong area. God will look after you. He'll meet your needs. But as long as you pursue and push toward money, you don't realize that the Bible says, they that will be rich. What does it say next? Anybody know? They that will be rich. Paul said it to Timothy. They that will be rich. All right, I'll throw out a few ideas. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. That's what happens. Say, oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get rich. I'm going to push hard. I'm going to get, you know, the best grades so I can get into the best colleges so I can get the best jobs. I'm going to be a rich dude. That's not all you're going to be. You're going to be full of holes, piercing yourself through with many sorrows. With that wealth comes all kinds of sorrows. The children of Israel were all over in the wilderness and they were lusting for flesh. And they got it all right. They got what they wanted. But when the food was still in their mouths, that's what it says in the book of Psalms. While the food was still in their mouths, God sent judgment upon them. And they were dying right and left. There was disease in the camp. They got what they wanted. They got the flesh, but they got the disease with it. You know, that kind of thing is real today. People who are pushing hard for money, they can get it, but they're also going to get a a whole world of heartache. And they may have rebellious kids. They may have accidents and diseases and problems and heartaches that they never thought they'd ever have. They'll get. So that's why it's important that we lay not up treasures on earth. If you're a saved person, born again, you expect to be in heaven one day, that's good, praise the Lord. But don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's a mistake. Look at verse 20. Uh, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. You see, you could go home after church today and find out that you've been robbed. Or you could wake up tomorrow morning and find out that in the middle of the night, someone came into your home and robbed you. What a horrible feeling to know that there were robbers in your house while you were away or while you were asleep in bed and they went through all your things and took all your expensive things. What a horrible feeling. And yet that can happen. Could happen to any one of us. Could happen to me. Could happen to anyone. But it won't happen in heaven. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So that tells us there's treasures in heaven. There are treasures available for you and I. It's not automatic. You don't just, everyone gets treasures. You have to lay them up. Now, also, if you just turn to chapter 19 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 20. uh, Well, let's see here. It's the... The story here in verse 16, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what thing shall I do that I may uh, have eternal life? 
And uh, Jesus said in verse 17, well, uh, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said, which? Jesus told him a few of them in verse 18 and 19. The young man, verse 20, said unto him, all these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I? Now, this guy was known as the rich young man. And so verse 21, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have, what's the next word? treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Jesus was inviting this young man to become an apostle. Come and follow me. He could have had, you know, the job as an apostle, but he was a wealthy young guy. Verse 22, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had not just possessions, he had great possessions. You see that? So it was money that was really tying this guy up. And it's always been that way. People have been following the money for thousands of years now. Wherever the money is, boy, that's where they want to be. Be careful. That's a trap. That's a trap. Um, there may be two companies offering you a job, and one of them may be offering you more money. Well, which company should I go for? The world will always tell you, go for the money. But that may not be God's will. It's happened more than once. A guy's gone for the money and in six months that company goes belly up and they're out of work. They're out of a job. They should have taken option A. A little less money, but with a stable company. Anyhow, the Lord can give wisdom about that. All we're saying here is that treasures are available as we live sacrificial lives for God on earth. That's how we get our treasures in heaven. If we're not going to live sacrificial lives for God on earth, there will be no treasures waiting for us when we get to heaven. It's as simple as that. Now, for now, uh, those treasures, what are they? What are they? They're a secret. We don't know what those treasures are. God promises us there'll be treasures for us in heaven, but he doesn't tell us what they are. Now, there's wisdom to that. God's not being nasty. He's being wise. Possibly, if some people knew the tremendous things waiting in heaven, they might be tempted to kill themselves to get there sooner. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but people have crazy thoughts. God keeps certain things about heaven secret. He will not share them. Treasures, well, what are they? What are we going to do with them? We don't know, but we can know one thing for sure. Just like with the crowns, there's a way to serve God with the crowns in heaven. There are ways to serve God with the treasures as well. You won't just have this big box of gold and, you know, the pearls and diamonds and crowns sitting there, you know, in, in your mansion. It's, it's, that's not what it is. They're meant to do something. They're meant to be used. And so whatever those treasures are, you'll have opportunity to use them. Crowns and treasures are only for those Christians who faithfully serve the Lord on earth. We have to move on here. Number three, will we remember our lives on earth? Now we're back in Revelation. Let's go to chapter six. Chapter six of Revelation. Will we remember our lives here on earth? And the answer is that it seems yes, it seems so. Revelation chapter 6, we have verse 10. Now, uh, verse 9 talks about some saved people that somehow were under the altar up in heaven. They'd been martyred while on earth. They lost their lives for Jesus. Verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? earth. And so it seems from this that people in heaven remember their lives on earth. That's interesting. Uh, question number four, will there be enjoyment in heaven? And the answer is a big yes. Heaven is a happy place. Look at chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. Revelation 15, verse 3, it says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now, in, you needn't turn there, but in Romans 14, verse 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And if you just turn another page to chapter 18 of Revelation and look, please, at verse 20. Here it says, 
Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So will there be enjoyment in heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely, there's going to be a lot of joy. Well, number five, question number five, will we get to eat food in heaven? And the answer is, I sure hope so. (laughs) No, the real answer is perhaps. The real answer is we don't know for sure. Now, take a look at verse chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19. Now it says here in verse 9, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So there's definite eating. There's a marriage kind of supper, a feast, and the Lamb, capital L, is a reference to Jesus Christ. That's there. However, where is this taking place? When we study the location of this event, we find that it happens after Jesus comes back to earth. So it doesn't happen in heaven. It happens at the beginning of his thousand year reign, his millennial kingdom. There is no indication that we'll be eating anything in heaven, although we cannot rule out the possibility. Okay, so, you know, we believe in the rapture where Jesus comes in the clouds and takes his people home with him. It's called the rapture, the catching away. It's the next event on the prophetic calendar. So just in case you ought to carry a Mars bar in your pocket or something with you, little humor there. Forget I said that. So let's move on to question number six. Will there be animals in heaven? And the answer again is yes. Believe it or not, yes. Chapter 19 and verse 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now this, of course, is when Jesus returns from uh, from heaven to earth. And so there has to be horses, because he's coming back on a horse. Um, At least it appears so. Maybe the horse will appear when Jesus needs it. It's a little bit of... But what about, what about our pet dog, our pet cat, our pet goldfish, our pet mice, and other things we have pets? And the quick answer is, folks, we just don't know. Will Fufu be up in heaven? Little Fifi, will, will you know, he or she be there? I don't know. You know, there's a movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Well, that's a movie. What does the Bible say? Uh, the Bible is silent on that one, folks. However, if I can share with you my opinion, I believe that somehow... Um, no, I'm not going to share my opinion. What's, what's, listen, let's move on to the next question. We're, we're safer that way, right? Will there be any pain or suffering in heaven? And the answer is no, none at all. Hallelujah. Chapter 21. Chapter 21, and look at verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, I hasten to say that this verse speaks of a time on earth after the millennial kingdom. However, I believe that it would equally apply for the very dwelling place of God Almighty in heaven. I don't believe that God's dwelling place in heaven is going to contain sorrow and pain and death and those things. And so we can safely assume to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord in a happy condition. That's good news, folks. There are some even here today that have not just aches and pains, but have some serious ailments that they're dealing with. Well, I'm happy to say that in heaven there's going to be no more migraines. How about that? If you've ever suffered from migraines, you know a little bit about suffering. Uh, There's going to be no more excruciating back aches and pains, no more aches and pains in your feet and in your knees and in in your joints, your wrists and so on. There's going to be no more palpitations of the heart. There's going to be no more high blood pressure or low blood pressure. There's going to be no diabetes in heaven. Amen to that. There's going to be, these things are beyond, they're gone. Uh, Praise the Lord, there's going to be perfect health. We're looking forward to that. No more pain and suffering. Question number eight, and this is for the, um, the decorators here today, but how is heaven decorated? Again, chapter 21, and look at verse 21. 
And it says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Once again, I point out to you that this speaks of the new Jerusalem. But there's no reason uh, to not believe that God is going to adorn his own heaven. Uh, in elegant uh, fashion, uh, with the finest materials. Um, there's no reason to believe that heaven is, is not beautifully uh, trimmed. His dwelling place, heaven, with the finest of materials. If God gave instructions to Solomon for the temple to be built of the finest materials, I'm sure that God's heaven is built of the most beautiful decorations. Um, well, that leads to question number nine. Are there houses in heaven? The answer is yes. And um, again, um, we're going to, with your permission, go back to John chapter 14, Gospel of John chapter 14. And let's see here. Verse 1, Jesus begins. He's speaking now to his, his little band of men his disciples, the apostles, in verse 1, chapter 14 of the Gospel of John, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. By the way, that proves the deity of Jesus Christ. Just as they were to believe in God as divine, they were to believe in Jesus as equally divine. Don't let anyone tell you that Jesus is a created being of God the Father. Jesus and God are one. The Jesus of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is God, Almighty God. So he's telling them, you know, ye believe in God, believe also in me. Then he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Well, Pastor, wait a minute. If he's God, why is he talking about the Father? That's why there's a trinity, folks. God is one God, eternally existed in three persons. It's beyond human comprehension, but that's what he's revealed. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In my Father's house are many mansions. Look at that word, mansion. Ooh, it's a nice looking word, isn't it? If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And so Jesus used this word mansion. Now a mansion is simply a dwelling place. That's the idea. That's the most basic concept of the word mansion. The technical meaning of this word mansion back in 1611 when our Bible was being published, it referred to a very large, elegant apartment. Now we don't really use that word mansion so much to mean a large, elegant apartment, although it still does mean the same thing. Usually we say a, a mansion is that monster palace there in, in the distance with all that beautiful shrubbery and manicured lawn. We say, that's a mansion. Well, that's true. That's a mansion. But, um, uh, and by the way, listen to this. Many churches provide housing, a dwelling place for their pastor. What's that dwelling place called? Anyone know? Starts with a letter M. A manse. You ever heard that? How many have ever heard that word? A manse? Oh, not many. I would have thought more. Well, manse and mansion are related. They mean essentially a dwelling place. Maybe one day the church here will provide a mansion for the pastor. <laughs> Little humor there. Uh, now, there are many gorgeous apartments uh, here on earth. In London, England, listen to this. By the way, if you go to buy a condo, if you're going to go buy a condo, all right, two bedroom, three bedroom condo, what might you spend for it? Now, I know it depends if it's downtown Vancouver, downtown Surrey. I realize there's a difference there, folks. But uh, you would expect to pay half a million dollars. Maybe if it's a real nice one, maybe a million dollars or something in downtown Vancouver. I don't know if you'd pay much more than a million dollars for your condo, would you? Would you? Well, listen to this. In London, England, there's a residential address called number one, Hyde Park. And they sell apartments to the world's richest people. The prices of these apartments uh, cost more than $10,000 per square foot. $10,000. Oh, you want two of them. $20,000. Now, these apartments come with more than two square feet. 
an Eastern European buyer reportedly paid over $235 million for a 16,000 square foot apartment, which is actually over $14,000 per square foot. Those are mansions, aren't they? They are huge, and they're apartments. I'll tell you this, though. God knows how to provide good housing for his children. God is a good builder. Question number uh, 10. What's the weather like in heaven? That's a good question. We just found out what the weather's like in Edmonton. Well, I'd like to uh, be the weatherman here. It's a perfect day. In heaven, it's a perfect day. Now, we're in Revelation chapter 21. Let's go there again. Revelation in chapter 21. And look, please, at verse 23. Revelation 21, 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Hey, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Don't need the sun anymore. Look at verse 25. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. How about that? Interesting place. Ah, it's very interesting. So uh, these verses speak of the new Jerusalem. Yes, we understand. But the presence of Almighty God in heaven chases away all forms of darkness and just leaving a perfect day. The weather in heaven is perfect. Question number 11, will there be any sin or evil in heaven? And the answer is none, absolutely none. Chapter 21, look at verse 27. It says, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that, that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh, uh, what's the next word? Lie, not even a lie is allowed. Look at that but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, again, this verse deals specifically with the eternal state after the millennial kingdom, but the principle is still true for heaven. Sin cannot be in heaven. Otherwise, it's no longer a place of perfection and beauty. Number 12, will we know each other in heaven? That's a common question. Will we know each other? The answer is yes. Now, supposing that the Lord were to come in the next five minutes and Christians from all over the world are suddenly taken home to heaven. Now, some of you have loved ones, saved family members in the Philippines. Some of you have saved family members in other parts of Canada. I happen to have a saved family mem member in Edmonton right now. Will I ever see her again? Of course. Jesus knows where she is. And if I ask Jesus, maybe he'll show me. Chances are he'll have us together anyhow. We've already agreed we're going to get mansions close to each other in heaven. We've, we've already settled that one. We'll visit each other a lot. But will we know each other in heaven? Well, the answer is yes. Um, I think we're going to go back to the Gospels now. We're just about done here. I think there's more things to talk about heaven, but I think we've done enough. Matthew chapter 17 Matthew chapter 17 is a very uh, interesting verse. It's known as the Mount of Transfiguration, this chapter. And in chapter 17, here we have after six days, uh, Jesus, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now look at verse 3 now. It says, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Now that's interesting. Um, how did they know? How in the world did they know, uh, like we're saying, will we know each other in heaven? How do they know that was Moses and Elijah? Well, they must have known. The Lord would reveal it. And if God would reveal something like that, he would reveal everything else. In Luke chapter 16, you've got the rich man who died and ended up in hell. He didn't go to heaven. In fact, let's go there now. Over to uh, Luke chapter 16. So uh, anyhow, Moses and Elijah seemed to know each other. There they were standing with Jesus. After the rich man died in his spiritual state in hell, he saw and he recognized Lazarus. 
Now, Lazarus used to sit outside his gate. Here's this poor guy. And uh, also, he seemed to recognize Abraham. He'd never met Abraham before in his life, but yet he saw him and recognized him. So in the spiritual state, people seem to know these things. Chapter 16, look please at verse 24. Verse 24, here's the words of the rich man. He's no longer rich, he's penniless, but he's in hell. He cries out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Boy, there's a lot. The Bible says a lot about hell. Maybe we should preach on that next. We've done heaven now and next we should do hell. But here's a guy actually in hell, actually experiencing hell, and we're learning something here. He's got full faculties. He knows what's going on. He certainly got the sensations of thirst and flame and heat, and he calls out. But the point that I want to make today is that he recognized Lazarus. Will we know each other? Well, in his after state, yes, he knew Lazarus. He saw and recognized him. Well, that brings this next question. Will we remember our lost friends and our lost loved ones in heaven? And I believe the answer is no. And I'm going to show you that if you turn back to Matthew chapter 7. Now, this is sad. When, you know, death in itself is kind of difficult to come to grips with at times. But the death of unsaved people... When unsaved people die, we know that that is forever. They're never going to get another chance, you know, to repent and get saved and go to heaven. They've made their decision. And for eternity, they're going to be separated from God. That is not something that any one of us cooked up. That is what God wrote in the Bible. So we have this life and this life only. Well, some people think, oh, well, I'm just going to die and go to hell. And then my, my family, they'll be in heaven. They'll weep for me. Boy, they'll cry big crocodile tears for me. I got news for you. They won't know you. They won't remember you. Now, we get the first clue in Matthew chapter 7. Um, let's look at verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Doing the, pause for a minute. Doing the will of the Father means to repent of your sins and to trust your soul to Jesus Christ and ask him to save you, forgive your sins, come in your heart. Salvation is a gift. Ask God for the gift. God, if I died now, I don't think I'd go to heaven. If I died, I think I'd go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. God, could you please forgive my sins, come in my heart, be my savior. God, I'm trusting you and you only. I used to trust the Pope. I don't want to trust him anymore. I used to trust how good a person I was. I used to say, well, I'm just as good as the next guy. Uh, the next guy's going to hell with me. So I, I, I don't want that. And so I, I need you, Jesus. I need you to forgive my sin and come in my heart and be my one and only Savior and take me to heaven when I die. And when you pray something like that, that's the will of the Father. And then salvation becomes a free gift. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How'd you get to heaven? Oh, well, I'm a pretty good guy. That's how. How'd you get to heaven? Well, I was, a, I was the best mother on earth. No better mother than me. I baked cookies for my kids every morning. Oh, that's a good mother. You deserve to go to heaven. If you could get to heaven by baking cookies, Jesus would never have had to die for you on the cross. If you could get to heaven by being just a good old Joe, Jesus would never have had to suffer the cat of nine tails and shed his blood for you and dip his soul into your hell. Truth is, you and I need a savior because we're on a collision course with hell. And only one way to avoid it, only one person can save us, and that's Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. You're either saved and on your way to heaven, or you're lost and you're on your way to hell. If you're here today and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, why don't you settle it today? You can settle it today. In just a few minutes, you can pray. Well, will we remember our lost loved ones? Well, I don't think so. Because Jesus says, not everyone that says, you know, Lord, Lord, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Many, now look at this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Pause there for a moment. You and I, we'd say, woo, that looks good. Boy, that's a nice resume. Wow. That's obviously, obviously, someone who does these things obviously is on their way to heaven. 
Well, wait a minute. Don't be so quick. Look what Jesus says. And then will I profess unto them, I, say these next four words with me. I never knew you. I never knew you. I never knew you. There was an old movie called A Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, and in it he gets to experience uh, what it's like to never be born. And he was going crazy out of his mind. People didn't know him. He went to his own mother, knocked on the door, and she opened up, and he says, Ma, it's me. I don't know you. She said, Don't you remember me, Mom? It's me. I don't know you. Get away from here. And she closed the door. You imagine the lost people who will stand before Jesus and say, but look at all the good works I did. Look at all the money I gave. Look at all of the the, the charitable deeds I did. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Now, when you never know someone, you never know them. And if Jesus is going to say, I never knew you, it's like Jesus is saying, I don't know who you are. If you're here today and you're saved, your life is hid with God in Christ. You're going to be with Jesus in heaven. And when you get to heaven, you're not going to remember lost people. Because if you did, you'd weep. And heaven all of a sudden wouldn't be happy anymore. Because all you'd think about are lost loved ones in hell. And I think God does this. He wipes them from our mind. Just like sometimes you forget a few things. This past week with my wife away, I forgot to bring my lunch to work twice (laughs) because she wasn't there to remind me and I totally forgot until lunchtime came. (laughs) Well, when you and I get to heaven, will we remember our lost loved ones? You know, Uncle Zeke and Aunt Matilda who were nice people, but they just weren't saved. They weren't born again. They died in their sins and they went to hell. Will we remember them? And I believe the answer is no, we won't. And they may call out to us and we'll say, I don't know you. Honest, I never knew you. So then Jesus went on to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Remember Revelation 21, God said that he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And if you had knowledge of loved ones burning in hell, you'd have tears. And God is going to wipe those tears away. Well, what's the most important thing about heaven? And if you're in... John, go back to John. (laughs) Chapter 14, I'll show you the most important thing about heaven. John chapter 14. We're done in just a couple of minutes. What's the most important thing about heaven? John chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you... I will come again and receive you unto myself. Who's talking here? Jesus. He says, I'll receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I'll tell you right now what the most important thing is in heaven. It's Jesus. He's the lover of our soul. He's the one who made it possible for us to escape hell and bypass hell and get to heaven all as a free gift. Being with Jesus, I think, is the most important thing about heaven. He is the reason. He is our reason for going to heaven. Oh, I'll be glad when I get to heaven. Oh, well, why is that? Oh, no more mortgage payments. Uh, no more sniffles and colds. Uh, no more uh, this, that crab grass on the front lawn. No more doctor bills, nothing. Oh, you're missing it completely. You're missing it completely. That's like a, a man who says, boy, you know, I can hardly wait to get married. And you say, oh yeah, why is that? And he says, well, I'll be able to move out of my parents' house. Yep, yeah, yeah, I'll be able to move out of my parents' house and uh, be able to brag to all my friends that I'm married. And he goes on and on and talks about everything else except the bride. Duh. Boy, there's a first-class turkey. For the groom, the most exciting thing about marriage is the bride. And for the bride, I think it's the groom. And for heaven, it's Jesus. He ought to be your first reason for wanting to go to heaven, is to be with the Savior, the one who loved you and died for you. Well, let me tell you a story. Rebecca... Uh, E. Holt of Murraysville, Pennsylvania. This was in the news. She had a pet schnauzer dog named Casey. 
Now, Rebecca went over to Europe for two years to live, and then she came back home for a visit. This was in the news. When her dog Casey saw her, he whined with so much happiness. He, he nearly flipped his tail off his body. He was so happy. Listen to this. He actually passed out. Plop. He fell unconscious. Plop. Like that. He was so beside himself with excitement. That is something. Now think about it. Two human years for Casey... That's 14 dog years. That's a long time to wait to see your master come back. Long time he waited. Last question and we're done. Who gets to go to heaven? That's a good question, isn't it? I talked to a man just the other day. And uh, in fact, he was working at one of the, uh, the um, senior retirement homes. And uh, I knew he was a religious man. But I asked him this question. I said, tell me, have you got heaven all figured out? <laughs> he he kind of <laughs> went sort of like that. And I said to him, are you still working on it? He said, yeah. I said, good, keep working on it. And then I gave him a gospel track to help. There's a lot of people that don't know for sure. What's going to happen to me after I die? Some people, the thought of it is so scary, they change the subject. Who gets to go to heaven? Look at John chapter 14, look at verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now watch these next words. I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. The only ones who get to go to heaven are the ones that are prepared. These people that have been prepared, how do you get prepared to go to heaven? You get prepared to go to heaven by salvation through Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with good works. It has everything to do with repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ. And that could happen when you're very young or you're very old, but you'd be silly to wait until you're very old because you may not make it. You'd be wise to do it today. If you're here and you're not sure for sure, the best thing you could do is cast yourself at Jesus' feet and admit to him that your sin has separated you from him. To be saved means that you understand that God is your creator and that your personal sin has separated you from him. And it means that if you died in that separate condition, you cannot go to heaven. You will be separated from God forever in a place called hell. But you know that Jesus Christ is God, the Savior. He died for you on the cross. He died for your sins. He was dead and buried and rose again the third day. And now he offers eternal life to you as a gift. If you'll repent of your sin and receive him into your life, into your heart by faith. That's what makes you saved. That's what prepares you for heaven. When we get to heaven, part of the thrill will be seeing and learning new things. And the Bible gives us a hint, and it says, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And again in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. How many have ever heard of Marco Polo, the explorer? Raise your hand, Marco Polo. That's about half of us, I guess. Marco Polo, one of the world's most famous explorers. He lived from 1254 uh, AD to 1324, something like that, about 70 years. Um, he was born into a wealthy uh, Venetian family. At 17 years of age, he traveled uh, over to the Far East with his father and brothers. That's when Kublai Khan was in power. And Kublai Khan got to like Marco Polo and commissioned him to represent him in business affairs. And that's what began Marco's journeys. And he visited China and he visited Mongolia and he visited Sri Lanka and he visited Turkey and he visited India. And he started writing these things down in a book and he published the book and people read the book and they were so amazed with the stories he told. Many of them doubted that they were true. When Marco Polo came to die, some some people came to him and said, Mr. Polo, now you have one last chance. Won't you recant? Won't you tell the truth that some of these stories you wrote in your book 
They were just fables. You made them up. Won't you recant some of these things? And that's when Marco Polo said his most famous ever words. And he turned to them and he said, I haven't even told you the half of what I've seen. We don't even know the half of heaven. Heaven is such a fantastic place. The most important thing is Jesus is going to be there. My friend, do you know for sure, for sure, for sure that heaven is yours? Or do you have some doubt? To have doubt is a normal, natural thing. How do you fix the doubt? You fix it with faith. You just believe what God has said. And God has said your sin is going to get you into hell. You need a Savior. And if you want the Savior, then you pray to receive Him. Let's bow our heads right now. And let's look to the Lord in prayer.